Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first briefing of our five-part series, Farm Bill in Focus. Today, we're starting off things by discussing the process and path forward for passing a bipartisan farm bill. I'm Dan Persett with the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. EESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan, bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide policymaker education about climate change topics. Uh, over that time, we've developed uh, some additional expertise helping rural utilities access federal resources from the Department of Agriculture. But today, we're really focusing on our congressional education work, which comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, most prominently, we do briefings like this. I hope folks in our online audience today have attended more than one. We have a lot of briefings. In fact, I did account this is our ninth briefing of the year, and we're still only in seven, uh, week 17 of the year. Uh, we started off the year with Congressional Climate Camp, which was a four-part series about budget and appropriations, public polling, non-CO2 emissions and pollutants, and the status of the Infrastructure Bill and the Inflation Reduction Act implementation. We also hold briefings on lots of different topics, uh, in addition to policies before Congress or coming before Congress. So in addition to Farm Bill uh, topics starting today, we also had a briefing last week about nuclear energy uh, programs underway at the Department of Energy. And the week before that, we took a look at um, programs underway at the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at DOE. Uh, we also do a lot of writing. Uh, we have a great biweekly newsletter we call Climate Change Solutions. I hope everyone uh, is, who hasn't already subscribed to that takes a moment and visits us online at www.eesi.org. In addition to Climate Change Solutions, you can visit our website to access all of our congressional education resources. Everything is free, uh, totally accessible and uh, open to the public. Uh, and you can find out um, pretty much anything you need to know about a climate change topic. My bet is that we probably have a resource about it uh, that was written or produced sometime in the last year or two. The reason why this is important uh, is because uh, our work needs to be timely, relevant, accessible, and practical in order for us to make a difference. We put a lot of thought into how our resources are presented to be science-based and be ready for the congressional staff person when they need the information. In fact, before they need the information and before they realize they need the information. In addition to this briefing series, uh, we held a briefing last month on organic agriculture in partnership with the Natural Resources Defense Council. We also have dozens of legislative side-by-side-by-side -side -side comparison fact sheets uh, that are already posted and waiting until we get uh, House and Senate text and we can update them to help congressional staff quickly compare uh, what the House and Senate are proposing and how that compares with each other and also with current law. Um, and it's much better for everyone to have this avail information available um, as you need it, because we all know, uh, or at least I anticipate, that in the next 12 to 18 months, most congressional staff people will become Farm Bill staff people. And it's much better to know that you have EESI as a resource before your boss asks a tough question about a climate change topic. And you can count on EESI, as always, to help with that. Uh, we've collected all of our resources, including our hearing tracker and article series, uh, which are also really great resources, uh, at a single website. And that's www.eesi.org forward slash 2023 Farm Bill. Congress renews the Farm Bill every five years to address numerous issues from conservation to crop insurance. The Farm Bill is the most impactful piece of legislation related to U.S. agriculture. It affects how and what food uh, we eat, uh, food access and nutrition, natural resources, rural development, and more. The 2018 Farm Bill, which was the last one, expires this September, and the process of developing the next Farm Bill is already underway and actually has been underway for some time. This briefing will help congressional staff get up to speed quickly on the basics of the Farm Bill, including the process for passing the bill, its history and evolution, and opportunities for a bipartisan path forward. We will hear from our expert speakers about what makes this Farm Bill special, including the relationship between the various policies and programs at stake and the investments provided by the Inflation Reduction Act. A key goal for this briefing series is to help staff learn about how to meaningfully engage with the 2023 Farm Bill, regardless of their boss's committee assignments. We have five really, really tremendous speakers, and um, I'm really looking forward to all of their presentations. After our presenters wrap, uh, we will have a Q&A uh, period. And since we're online today, our online audience has two options for submitting questions to us. The first is you can send us an email, and the email address to use is ask, and that's A-S-K, at EESI.org. Or you can follow us on Twitter or other social media sites at EESI online. And please be sure to use the hashtag, hashtag EESI talk. 
Our first presenter today is Jim Monk. Jim has been with the Congressional Research Service since 2003 and has covered three farm bills. Jim presently focuses on the farm bill budget, agricultural appropriations, and policy for agricultural credit. Jim is a farm kid from Illinois who became motivated to study economics because of incentives in the tax code and the farm bill. And before joining CRS, Jim worked for the US uh, Department of Agriculture's Economic Research Service. Jim, you are a familiar face and a familiar name to a lot of congressional staff because of your work on the farm bill. I really am looking forward to hearing your presentation today. Thanks, Dan. So as Dan said, let's see, I got my mute off, right? As Dan said, Congress passes the farm bill about every five years. Um, it has become the main, Daniel, I need you to, there we go. Okay, just a minute. Now I can advance my slides. Okay, so the, um, the farm bill has become the main legislative vehicle to set agricultural policy for the next five years and beyond, and is also the legislative vehicle to carry changes to uh, that affect longstanding permanent laws that continue. Uh, the breadth of the Farm Bill has grown over time, over the decades, but has general, is generally limited to the jurisdiction of what's in the, the jurisdiction of the House and Senate Agriculture Committees. Other, other speakers will talk about um, examples of what's not in the jurisdiction, but this next slide lists the titles of the Farm Bill that was enacted in 2018, gives an example of the breadth of the farm bill, ranging from, you know, Title I is the traditional farm commodities programs, um, and, and there's crop insurance, title, farm conservation, trade promotion, nutrition assistance, farm loans, rural development, and ag research and extension programs. There's a little forestry title, bioenergy, horticulture development, and a miscellaneous title that we stick a few things about uh, livestock sometimes in. So that's the breadth of the farm bill. It, and it is, it crosses pretty much all of the relevant parts of agriculture jurisdiction that um, are kind of food and, and fiber related. As Dan indicated too, um, why do the farm bill now in, in 2023? It's because we're at the five year cycle of when the 2018 farm bill begins expiring at the end of this fiscal year. Um, one item to note is that expiration looks different across the breadth of the farm bill. Uh, there's different consequences on different categories of programs. Some programs continue can continue under appropriations or continuing resolutions. Some programs would cease beginning even as early as, as October 1st this fall. Um, other programs don't have consequences until we get to the new calendar year in January 1st. And, and an extension may work for some programs, but not all. So the, the, the consequences of expiration are not easy to, to confine. Um, one thing that agriculture has different from a lot of other authorization bills in the federal government is that for the farm commodity subsidies, there exists still permanent law that dates from the 1940s. And an expiration of the farm bill means that we would revert to permanent laws still on the books from the 1940s, which are really out of touch with modern economics, modern trade, trade policy, and it would be really expensive to the government. So it helps this expiration consequence of reverting to permanent law helps the Farm Bill get Congress's attention and uh, not just get left aside. To talk a little bit about the legislative process, the Farm Bill is no different than any other legislation. It generates some disagreement, but historically the Farm Bill has been less bipartisan and more often about differences between commodities or regions. Um, the breadth of the modern farm bills that we saw in, across the 12 titles helps build coalitions to, to help get votes in places that aren't solely agriculture focused. The, the legislative process of you know, how a bill becomes a law is really, again, no different for the farm bill than other pieces of legislation. The House and the Senate develop versions of you know, their own versions of the bill separately. Um, the Agriculture Committee, I think, is uh, well known for having listening sessions out of, in, in, in farm country and, and, and cities to get public input before they start writing the bill. 
Um, there's the usual subcommittee process of, you know, subcommittee and committees, the committee holding hearings with witnesses on Capitol Hill. Um, eventually, there'll be a business meeting of the Agriculture Committee where they do what's called a markup um, and, and have legislative text that they debate in committee, have a committee vote, and then eventually successfully report the bill as a committee bill to the floor. There's the usual floor consideration that you can watch on C-SPAN. Um, where there can be floor amendments, the contents of the bill can change on the floor from members of the whole chamber, and then there'll be a chamber vote on the bill. Same thing happens in the other chamber, and those two different bills that pass the House and pass the Senate um, would be conferenced to reconcile differences between the House bill and the Senate bill. Um, during that conferencing, often USDA will come to the Hill to provide more in-depth technical assistance about how program that, that's in the, the chamber passed bills might work. Um, but there becomes a conference agreement. Single version of the, of the, con of the House and Senate bills comes down to one, one joint version. And that version will be voted on in the House and the Senate. And eventually then go to the president. President signs the bill, the bill becomes law, and USDA implements the new law. So that's you know the usual how a bill becomes a law that we watch in Schoolhouse Rock. Um, one thing to kind of to help watch you know for the, the all the actors that can be there is the four corners. What people refer to as the four corners of the agriculture committees, meaning the chair and ranking member of the House Agriculture Committee and the Senate Agriculture Committee. Um, you can watch those four corners. And they'll negotiate kind of amongst themselves, representing their, their committee and the chamber. And um, if you get three of the four corners in line, then it helps get the bill across the finish line. Um, timelines. The last three farm bills, starting with the 2008 farm bill, have had some hiccups that previous farm bills didn't have. Um, they started taking longer in 2008 and 2014, and the 2014 and 2018 farm bills had problems passing the House floor. To look at that, what that, see what that looks like on a timeline, the 2008 Farm Bill should have been a 2007 Farm Bill. The House went first, got it off the floor by in, in summer. The Senate did it in the fall. It needed the spring of 2008 to finish conference, but then it hit vetoes from George W. Bush. Congress overrode the vetoes, but we finally ended up with the Farm Bill in 2008. The next farm bill should have been a 2012 farm bill. The Senate acted first that year, the Little Diamonds, and then the House marked up the bill in July, but it stalled then. Kind of during the presidential election cycle, uh, I think that contributed to the, the bill stalling through the rest of, of 2012. That's how we got the one-year extension at the end of 2012 that covered 2013. In 2013, the bill was reintroduced in the new Congress. It took you know, it takes several months in, in a new Congress like this year for the committees to assemble and get going um, in all the process. And so then the House and Senate marked up bills in uh, like May, I guess it was, of 2013. When the, when the floor went, when the bill went to the floor in the House, it didn't have, it ended up not having the votes to pass and it failed on the floor. That's the little yellow diamond or triangle. The notable thing in 2013 is that the House split apart the bill into a nutrition bill and a farm farm bill. And those passed later in the summer into September. The bill was stitched back together for conferencing with the Senate, and it was passed as a, as a combined whole regular farm bill in January of 2014. That took the longest that we've had of any farm bill. The 2018 farm bill was faster. It got passed within the calendar year but not without some uh, fireworks in that the bill also failed to pass on the House floor um, and was later, you know, a month later in June, did get the votes to pass. Senate acted in, in June and we had conference through the summer and fall and the bill was enacted after the elections in 2018 and during the lame duck session. So very variable, you know, the past cannot predict the future, but those are examples of things that have happened of note in the past three farm bills you may hear about. To um, talk about budget, I'm trying to go through this pretty quickly. 
but um, for the budget, Congress organizes itself for, 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 to control the budget. You have authorizing committees, which the agriculture committees are, and appropriations committees, and they control different pots of money, mandatory spending and discretionary spending. For discretionary programs, all the Farm Bill does is authorizes appropriations. Funding comes through Appropriations Acts later. For mandatory spending programs, the Farm Bill both authorizes and provides the funding and uses Congressional Budget Office baseline and scores. A baseline is a projection at a point in time of what future spending would be assuming current law continues. It's a benchmark against we measure what a bill will do. And what the bill does is measured as a score. It's the expected change that a bill would make compared to current law. Pluses increase spending, negatives decrease spending. And the idea behind pay-go or cut-go is to not let a bill increase the deficit. To keep it from not from keep it from exceeding the baseline, cut goes a little more restrictive than pay go because it doesn't allow tax provisions to offset spending. But that's really irrelevant for the farm bill because taxes aren't in the jurisdiction of the agriculture committee. So what's that look like in a quick example? Hypothetical program has about 100 million dollars a year of baseline. A bill is proposed to, in some cases, increase spending. That's the little pluses or reduce spending little minuses. These three provisions in this hypothetical bill have a net, still a net positive indicating that it would violate PAYGO because it's increasing spending. The score is positive, it increases spending compared to the baseline. And then my last slide is to look at what's the baseline for the current farm bill. Other speakers will probably talk about this more, but um, there's about $1.4 trillion of baseline for the next 10 years for largely four titles of the Farm Bill, but there are five other titles of the Farm Bill that get a sliver of mandatory spending, even though those titles receive more funding from discretionary appropriations. And with that, I will turn it back and let our next speaker go. Thank you, Jim. That was a great presentation and um, a, great a great opportunity to remind folks in our online audience today that the presentation materials that you'll be seeing uh, will all be available online at www.esi.org. So if you'd like to go back and revisit Jim's presentation, especially those cool timeline charts, um, everything will be available um, online, uh, which um, is uh, very helpful. I'd also like to point out that when Jim was talking about the breadth of the issues, um, that's a lot of issues. And so in addition to our briefing today, which is more process oriented, uh, every two weeks for the next while, we will have another Farm Bill briefing where we look more closely um, at some of those specific issues. And so two weeks from today, we will be back talking about climate, energy, and economic win-wins uh, in the Farm Bill. Uh, we'll be back on May 24th. Uh, every one of these will be a Wednesday afternoon. May 24th for Unlocking Rural Economies, Farm Bill Investments in Rural America. Uh, we will be back on June 7th for the future of forestry in the Farm Bill. And then finally, on June 21st, we will have conservation practices from farms to forests and wetlands. And just like today, all of those briefings uh, will be archived, the live cast, the presentation materials on our website. If you RSVP and you know you can't attend or something pops up at the last second, that's okay. Um, if you RSVP, that'll ensure that you get a link to the live cast as well um, as all the presentation materials and eventually summary notes, which take a couple of weeks to put together, but are really, really useful as well. So if you haven't rsvp for our future briefings and you think those topics, you'd like to learn more about them, uh, I encourage everyone to do that. Our second speaker today is Jonathan Coppas. Jonathan is Assistant Professor of Agriculture Policy and Law at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and Director of the Gardner Agriculture Policy Program. He's the author of The Fault Lines of Farm, Bill, or Farm Policy, A Legislative and Political History of the Farm Bill. Prior to his role at the University of Illinois, uh, Jonathan served as Chief Counsel and Special Counsel to, for the Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry and Legislative Assistant uh, to Senator Ben Nelson. Jonathan grew up on his family's farm in Western Ohio. Jonathan, welcome to our briefing today. I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Dan, uh, and thank you, EESI, for uh, allowing me to join this otherwise distinguished panel. Um, so greetings to everybody from uh, the Grand Prairie here in East Central Illinois, where spring is, is trying its best to stick around. So I'm tasked with a very brief and rapid uh, run through of the history of the Farm Bill. And so I'm going to do my best to um, 
you know, summarize about 90 years. So if Congress actually reauthorizes the bill in 2023, uh, it will mark 90 years since uh, this uh, federal direct assistance to farmers uh, was first put in place. We'll talk about that history and, and do a quick run through. I also uh, at the top want to apologize. I have class to teach here at the top of the hour. And so I got to jump off and we'll miss the question and answer. But the expertise on this panel will, will do a great job of answering. So I, I, uh, but I do apologize for that. Uh, in, in true sort of Madisonian uh, uh, theory, uh, the farm bill's strength is in its coalition, multiple factions coming together, bringing votes with them to get a, to get a bill across the double majority in Congress and the House and the Senate. For the farm bill, the strength, uh, its political strength is in this sort of tripartite coalition, this traditional farm set of interests, uh, regional based, commodity based, as Jim mentioned. Um, they're the ones that came together at the at the beginnings to push a farm bill through. Uh, uh, beginning in the mid 1960s, then we added the um, food assistance through the food stamp program, now known as the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. This map is from uh, FRAC. This is their uh, congressional district uh, participation numbers. And so we've got farm assistance, we've got direct assistance for food for low income households, to, and the third uh, leg of this. Uh, very strong political uh, coalition then is the conservation programs mentioned and, and discussed in more detail uh, as we go. Here we have direct assistance again to farmers, but this time uh, to help cover the costs or help encourage conservation of natural resources. So everything from clean water to clean air, uh, reducing soil erosion, helping with wildlife habitat and so forth. So this farm bill uh, makes its way through the difficult congressional process that Jim highlighted because of the votes that come together around these, um, these different major titles or major areas that it, that it deals with. So we take a, a long view of history. Here is, a, is my attempt to summarize it in a very brief uh, picture. For those of you that are, are numbers nerds, you know, be careful with this chart. This is the total cropland used for crops as reported by USDA. It's from 300 million to 400 million. So I'm exaggerating the up and downs a little bit over time all the way back to 1910 to give us kind of this long view of production uh, in, in this country. And uh, I'm gonna jump through um, uh, each one of these major farm bills that give us kind of uh, uh, you know landmarks along the way or, or road marks along the way. Um, the first one being the 1933 Agricultural Adjustment Act. Uh, and we can see some of the uh, significant acreage shifts over a, a few eras that we'll talk about briefly. If you want to look at prices, these are the market year, marketing year average prices, which is what we typically use in the commodity subsidy or commodity support programs as part of the, the calculation to trigger payments. And this just gives you, again, that long view since back to 1910, as reported by USDA, the national average market price over the course of a year uh, for the three major crops, the three great major regional crops, corn, wheat, and cotton. Uh, cotton's on the other side there with uh, uh, dollars per pound. Um, and corn and wheat dollars per bushel. And again, here's just a long view kind of sense of how market prices have moved and, you know, and, and we can think of policy in response to sometimes those market prices or attempts to try to respond to uh, particularly low price um, eras that we see uh, in this history. So again, let's start at the beginning uh, in the New Deal. So we had a farm depression after World War I. Um, we had unsuccessful attempts to push uh, farm support legislation through Congress in the 20s, but it was the Great Depression that really hit in October of 1929 with the crash. Uh, and it was Franklin Roosevelt and the uh, uh, Democratic Congresses that pushed through this, the New Deal legislation. So all kinds of emergency response legislation Contained in one of the earliest uh, efforts under the New Deal, May 13th of 1933, was the Agricultural Adjustment Act. Very broadly written bill, basically uh, giving the Secretary of Agriculture vast authority to try to address the crisis and the depression in agriculture. Um, and not long after that, we also suffered through a Dust Bowl and we had a, a follow-up legislation in 1936. That was kind of our first uh, faulting steps or, or faltering steps at conservation. Uh, some efforts to pull land out of production it was was highly erodible in the wind and drought scenario out in the western plains, southwestern plains in particular. So that's our New Deal sort of starting point. Of course, we go through World War II. We come out of the out of World War II. We're still operating under this New Deal era, this this attempt to try to control 
uh, acres produced and try to keep a floor under prices so the prices of the farmers stay up, but that the, that support system doesn't encourage overplanting. Um, this happens to uh, also be the era, 1949, that Jim mentioned, that permanent authority. And that's why it's so out of date and out of touch in terms of how uh, the farm economy exists today and what kind of spending challenges would happen if we reverted our commodity support policy back to 1949. That's post-World uh, War II um, legislation. 1949 uh, also marked sort of the early stages of the technological revolution in agriculture. The green revolution, uh, we often talk about it, mechanization, chemical fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers, um, and other uh, chemical inputs, pesticides, and then better hybrid seed. And we drastically expand our yields, our production capability in a relatively short amount of time, which means policies attempting to control acres are less and less effective because we are producing more and more per acre and they get very politically difficult. And that kind of sums up the 1950s, uh, very uh, tense, fights, inter-regional fights, uh, particularly between the Midwest and the South, corn interests, cotton interests, um, over this policy and a big kind of heated debate over multiple farm bills about what to do uh, with a policy that was obviously failing um, as, you know, billions and billions of dollars worth of surplus commodities, surplus wheat, surplus cotton, surplus corn and feed grains being uh, uh, forfeited to the federal government under the programs. This culminates uh, in, in one of the more notable farm bills of the era in 1956, um, when uh, then President Eisenhower fought with the Democratic Congress over policies. Uh, he vetoed the first farm bill that was produced by that Congress. He demanded what he called the soil bank, which was an attempt to shift some of this policy into a conservation. So we're moving acres, instead of moving acres amongst commodities, shifting acres into a conservation uh, set of programs under the soil bank. Um, so he vetoed it his reelection year as a, uh, a uh, response to the Congress that, that was not uh, um, cooperating with what he, where he thought the policy should go. So I think an interesting political moment. Eventually, Congress backed down and passed the bill uh, more to his liking, and he signed it into law. The Soil Bank, however, was pretty briefly uh, in operation, and um, part of it was terminated just a couple years later and eventually faded out. But it did include... Uh, the first version of the Conservation Reserve Program, the idea that we would pay farmers or pay landowners to take uh, highly erodible land and remove it from production for uh, multiple years, anywhere from three to 10 years. And so that was 1956. You can see on the acres chart uh, following that, that policy was actually tightened and strengthened in the 1960s um, and, and focused largely on feed grains and pulled quite a few acres out of production uh, during that time. There is uh, a fascinating story in this 1960s time frame. If we think about the coalition building and the farm bill uh, aspects, the Food Stamp Act of 1964 was passed in the wake of the first defeat of a farm bill on the House floor in 1962. Again, this regional fight, and multiple other political battles uh, uh, brought down uh, a farm bill in 1962. And in order to get uh, revised legislation for cotton and wheat in 1964, Congress paired up the votes for a food stamp act and a cotton and wheat bill. They weren't the same legislation, but they sort of formed that initial coalition that bridged the vote counting out of just rural districts in the House to bring in uh, districts um, across the spectrum, including in urban areas. We then have the, the big spike in 1972, uh, Nixon, President Nixon and Secretary Butts with a uh, grain deal with the Soviet Union, and spike in prices, inflation, and all kinds of consumer demands. And in 1973, that farm bill is the first one to combine food stamps and farm support policy. And it also shifted out of that, out of the, what was the remaining of that New Deal policy to this target price concept where we're triggering direct payments to farmers. And then we go uh, into the 70s inflation and the 80s farm economic crisis. Uh, and one of the more landmark legislation uh, passed by Congress in 1985, the Food Security Act, which, introduced, or which initiated the modern conservation set of programs. Uh, particularly conservation reserve program and the compliance mechanisms. Uh, this was in 1985, and, and uh, some of that was a product of some of the fighting around budget and spending issues. We get into the 90s, and Jim mentioned this, the 1996 uh, Federal Agriculture Improvement Reform Act, or the FAIR Act, is uh, probably the most major change to farm support policy since 1933. It decoupled everything, so we're not paying farmers based on what they plant and moved it off of acre uh, prices based on the market. Uh, but when we had a price crash after that and saw a lot of ad hoc payments. 
We get in the modern area. I'm not going to uh, overstate this. Jim talked a lot about these modern modern era farm bills, uh, but I think the main takeaway from this that we see again is not just the, the political strength of the of the political coalition um, across the, the different titles, but what happens when that coalition uh, turns on itself or gets torn apart, largely under budget fighting, and that's the 2014 2018 farm bill experiences in which those fights over the SNAP program, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program really broke apart the coalition and, uh, and caused significant problems in passage in the House of Representatives in particular. So there's our brief history. You can kind of think about that back over the prices and acreage issues. Uh, a couple other quick notes, just um, this 2018 Farm Bill existence has been rather unique because of the massive amount of ad hoc and supplemental payments that have gone out in the wake of trade conflicts in 2018 and 19, and then this, and the coronavirus assistance programs. Uh, in 2020 and 2021. And as mentioned, also the Inflation Reduction Act is the first major investment in conservation programs outside of a farm bill. And so this is pretty historic uh, in terms of the amount of, of the investment for conservation and the focus on things like climate change and otherwise. And with that, I will uh, say thank you again for having me on and hand it back over to Dan. And again, apologize that I cannot stick around for questions, but you can find me here at the University of Illinois if you have any follow-ups. Thank you. Jonathan, that was an incredible presentation, and um, I really appreciate it. Uh, great slides as well, um, and we will definitely miss you in the Q&A, but we will release you to your students, uh, and um, thanks so much for your uh, willingness to participate in our briefing today. Um, Jonathan just talked about a lot of things. Jim talked about a lot of things. We'll have a question and answer period, and while I always have questions that I could ask, I'd also really like to ask questions from our online audience. So if you have a question about what you've heard so far, uh, or what you're about to hear, you can send us an email. The email address to use is ask, that's A-S-K at EESI.org. You can also follow us on Twitter and other social media at EESI online and send in your questions that way. Our third panelist today is uh, Nadine Lehrer. Nadine is an associate professor in the food studies program at Chatham University, Chatham University. Her interests include agriculture policy development, challenges and opportunities in sustainability and uh, in sustainable agriculture, and diverse views around food, farming, and land use. Nadine has also worked in mediating conflict, conflicting views of sustainable agriculture in Peru and Brazil, small-scale vegetable and livestock production, and urban forestry. Her publications include U.S. Farm Bills and Policy Reforms, Ideological Conflicts Over World Trade, and Renewable Energy and Sustainable Agriculture. Nadine, welcome to our briefing today, and I think you might get the award for sort of most if you were with us in person, you would have gotten the most distance traveled award for our briefings because you're coming to us from Costa Rica today. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much, Stan. I really appreciate the opportunity to participate. Um, I am luckily on sabbatical, and so I appreciate the ability to participate via Zoom. Um, I've been looking at farm bills for almost 20 years, and, and what I wanted to do today was to Kind of add a little bit of shape and painting to what Jim and Jonathan have talked about in terms of some of the historical trends that you see in farm bills and that you might think about with the 2023 farm bill. So I essentially want to make two points that I can't get my slides to move. Let me try to share them again. Apologies. Okay, we got it now, perfect. Um, so the first point that I wanna make is that farm bills happen within a certain historical political situational context and that context matters. So a lot of this we just got from Jonathan, right? The 1933 farm bill, this first setup of support payments um, happened in part because of the Great Depression, right? Farmers wanted this kind of support in the 20s when they needed it, they couldn't get it. <clears throat> it was the historical and political context around the depression that really made this seem like a package of supports that um, was doable and feasible and worthwhile. Similarly, in 1973, the increase in gas prices, food prices, brain sales to the Soviet Union, this idea that we weren't producing enough to meet demand kind of brought in the Nixon administration to say, hey, we gotta increase production and to change the mechanisms of commodity programs to increase production. That wasn't a change that would have necessarily happened 10 years earlier, even though there were strong debates about it all the way along the way. 
1985 farm bill, the farm financial crisis, um, the overproduction of the 70s and the recognition of the environmental impact of agriculture um, became stronger in that period. So, you know, you had the you had the environmental decade of the 70s, and all of a sudden the context was right for conservation groups to really get a place at the table and to make this big move for conservation into the 85 Farm Bill. And similarly, the 1996 Farm Bill that Jonathan talked about too, this idea of at the time reducing the price supports and subsidies came in a context where World Trade Organization negotiations were really pushing for reform, Republican Congress, budget deficit, high farm prices all came together to make this possible in a way that it hadn't been in 1990 and in the way that it wasn't able to again in 2002. So if you look at kind of information from different policy scholars, you see some principles that can help us, right, understand this. So most policy change is incremental, right? The government is designed to move slowly and cautiously and carefully. And so most change is slow. There's occasional bursts of change and sometimes situational context is part of what shapes opportunities for change and stability. So what do we mean by situational historical context? These kind of dynamics that Jim and Jonathan both brought up um, create a backdrop against with which congressional staffers, Congress people, um, advocacy groups, farm organizations are working to kind of make their priorities part of the farm bill. But there's sort of the backdrop that can facilitate certain kinds of policy and not other kinds of policy at a certain point in time, if that makes sense. So I'll give you an example from the 2008 Farm Bill. If you look in the couple of years before 2007, which was when we were supposed to have the Farm Bill, you see a lot of conversation around trade and trade provisions. And the idea that WTO pressure was going to push for reform to commodity subsidies. If you go ahead another year or two towards when we actually had the Farm Bill, you actually see very little of that in news coverage, very little about WTO and a whole lot about ethanol, biofuels, renewable energy, right? So the context around that farm bill changed in the couple of years before 2008, and it facilitated sort of a different set of policies, right? Not necessarily a commodity reform, but a, a farm bill that was focused more on status quo and more on increased renewable energy, right? So why, why was that the case? You had a number of factors. Suspension of WTO negotiations in 06 really reduced that pressure. Uh, congressional elections, you went from a Republican Congress to a Democratic one that was more domestically focused at the time. Um, rising gas prices at that time in the early 2000s made it really appealing to look to um, corn ethanol as a fuel additive or a fuel alternative, right? So it meant more people were planting corn. Um, and it meant that there was more demand for corn, right? So higher prices, higher prices across the board for commodities, right? And that had budget impacts for the farm bill, right? So commodity prices that were high meant lower countercyclical or loan deficiency payments at the time, lower farm payments, brought the budget of the farm bill, the proposed budget, back into what looked much smaller, more budget compliant, made it seem less pressing to think about commodity reform and more pressing to think about renewable energy and to think about ethanol and how to, how to manage this. Um, on top of that, you sort of had a political public mood, right? Um, just showing some images, right? This was post 9-11. It was pre-housing bubble, pre-Great Recession. And you had this idea, right? That was very resonant in the rhetoric of like homegrown energy, reducing reliance on foreign oil from the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera, right? So within this context, it shaped what players were able to do in the farm bill and it shaped the way that policy turned out. So that's the first point. Second point is kind of reiterating in some ways some of what Jim and Jonathan said, right? And just highlighting the role of issue expansion in the Farm Bill. When the Farm Bill started, they were, they were smaller. They were about commodity prices. They were about price support. They were about grain reserves, right? And over time, uh, the scope of the Farm Bill has increased, right? And Jonathan highlighted that as kind of the source of a lot of the stability in Farm Bill passage, right? So just to highlight that again, right, the 1970s, Jonathan talked about a lot, right, this rural urban alliance, support for commodity programs and support for nutrition programs that happened when you put these two bills together. The 1980s, right, conservation programs, which in the 80s were mostly set aside programs, so you take land out of production for conservation, that also means you're reducing production and 
that means you're potentially increasing prices for commodities, right? Because you reduce production. And so that's appealing both to commodity groups and to environmental groups. So you have this synergy that allows new programs to come into the farm bill and that importantly expands the stakeholder base, right? Once conservation groups were part of farm bill, they're part of farm bill. Once nutrition groups are part of farm bill, they have a stake and they have an interest and they wanna be there and they're at the table. So you have this increasingly complexifying set of issues and set of stakeholders when you go into these debates. Similarly, in the 1990s, you had to move towards more sustainable ag programs, working land programs. In other words, not just set asides, but conservation practices on farm alongside production. And in the 2000s, you saw more energy provisions and specialty crops. This isn't an exclusive list. Um, there's a lot more issues as well, but I just wanted to give a sense of how these dynamics shape farm bills and future farm bills. A little bit of focus on conservation, sustainable ag, and then on renewable energy because we're with EESI today. So if you look, right, the early conservation programs in the Farm Bill were about soil erosion, conservation, not so much for conservation's own sake, but more for, pre for preserving agricultural soils for future production. But as you get into the 1980s, you see these set-aside programs taking hold. Um, in the 85 Farm Bill, you even saw the first kind of sustainable ag-oriented programs, uh, LISA, which is now the SARE program. But the initial conservation programs, again, were taking land out of production. Until you started to get to 96, the EQIP program, 2002, the CSP program, which we're making more of a case that um, on-farm practices can contribute to um, agricultural conservation just as much as set-asides or, or in different ways, let's say. So over that time, you saw a real proliferation of conservation prog programs, and then in the 2010s, more of a consolidation of the programs. Um, and also, you know, the, the IRA kind of throws an interesting wrench in there in terms of the funding for conservation. That is something that will come up, presumably, in the 23 Farm Bill debates. Um, so if you look at it, right, if you look at programs that might be considered under sustainable ag broadly writ um, in the Farm Bill, there's a ton, right? So if you look at the CRS reports and the NSAC reports, you can get information on all of these. But my only point here is to say um, there's a lot, right? So commodity title is a big part of the Farm Bill. Nutrition, obviously, in terms of budget and um, is also a huge part. But, but conservation and sustainable agriculture is, is very well represented um, over the last 40 years. Similarly, renewable energy, it's obviously slightly newer programs, slightly fewer. Um, but there are a number of programs mostly around bio-based fuels, bioenergy, um, et cetera. And there's some great CRS reports that can give you more information about those. Um, just notes about renewable energy and biofuels in the Farm Bill, right? The 2002 Farm Bill was the first to have its own energy title. That was expanded in 2008 in the case that we talked about. And those programs were mostly reauthorized in the 2014 and 2018 Farm Bills. Um, there was some shift from earlier on mandatory funding to discretionary funding, which can affect um, the way people are looking at the programs coming up into the 2023 Farm Bill. But again, it's an illustration of, of sort of this issue expansion and how a new issue can come into the Farm Bill and then develop a history and a trajectory of its own. One thing important to think about with energy is that the Farm Bill is not by far the only place where you have le energy legislation. Um, so a lot of energy legislation happens outside the Farm Bill and the Energy Committee um, other ag-related energy bills, renewable fuel standards, cafe standards, um, tax incentives for biofuels, also some of those in the IRA. Um, and so just to note that there are a number of different places where people are looking at energy aside from the Farm Bill. And so what's in the Farm Bill is a little bit more narrow in that regard. So uh, essentially, points I'm trying to make is when you're thinking about if you're working on the 2023 Farm Bill or if you're watching the 2023 Farm Bill, um, things to keep in mind that situational context matters. This includes the normal bipartisanship that you often see in Farm Bills, but also the partisanship that we've seen in recent decades in Congress, regional dynamics, stakeholder positions, current events, public mood, and it also in includes the history and trajectory of issue expansion, right? the ways in which conservation and sustainable agriculture, renewable energy, or really any other issue that you're thinking about have played out historically, have some repercussions for what the debates look like now, and maybe give you a little bit of insight as you're thinking about what might possibly happen. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over and my email's down at the bottom if you wanna contact me further. Thanks so much.
Thanks so much, Nadine. That was a really great presentation um, and uh, really, really appreciate you joining us today from taking time away from your sabbatical, which I'm sure is much earned. So thank you very much. Looking forward to revisiting some of these um, contextual issues in our Q&A. Our next speaker is Sakina Shabazz. Uh, Sakina is the policy director at the Berkeley Food Institute, where she supports its state and local policy research and educational advocacy efforts. Before that, Sakina was deeply involved in anti-hunger and anti-poverty research and advocacy with DC Hunger Solutions and the Congressional Hunger Center, where she was an Emerson National Hunger Fellow. Sakina, welcome to our briefing today. Looking forward to hearing your presentation. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and also thank you to all the speakers who came before me. I think they've laid some really important context and foundation for some of the uh, contents that I'll be talking about today, which mostly is like what's in the farm bill and also framing it around some of the key pay players that are part of this process. Next slide. So we've already seen this already from Jim. Um, I think it's a good refresher to know what the 12 titles are that make up the farm bill. And just to kind of get a sense for this, because we're going to talk about what also is not in the Farm Bill and the corresponding departments within the federal government that represent those areas. But I thought it would be really good just to kind of give a little refresher of what this looks like. Next slide. And so if you are going back and looking at public law for the Farm Bill or for the one that was most recently passed in 2018, the Agricultural Improvement Act of 2018, you're going to find a table of contents, you're going to find the authorizing language title area, and then a breakdown from there that will reflect the different policy areas that make up the Farm Bill corresponding to those different titles. But if you're looking at public law, I think the bill that was passed in 2018 was probably around 538 pages long. And so I think if you're going in and looking for a specific title or thinking about a specific policy area that you want to look at, it's good to know what this breakdown looks like so that you can be more supportive to the member that you're working for, the particular committee that you're working for when you're doing that research. Also, just a further breakdown, you're going to have subtitles that's often in reference back to older public law that's in place. And also the parts are divisions within those specific subtitles. And so it might give reference to a specific program or things of that nature. And then when you're digging into the sections, you're going to get definitions. You're going to get the purpose of the program. It's going to outline which agency is responsible, amendments to prior public law, program administration, requirements around reporting and things of that nature. And so I thought this would be a, a little bit of a good overview in case you go back and find yourself looking at the actual 538 page long public law that made up the, the uh, 2018 Farm Bill. Next slide. This is what this will look like if you're just going through and doing a search on the congressional website. Um, it's you know going to give you the authorizing language and this is specifically in reference to the title one which is commodities and examples of what those different subtitles look like around policy, marketing loans, sugar, so on and so forth. Next slide. I thought it was also to, uh, worth it to dig into what this looks like for um, the miscellaneous title, which is Title 12. I think it's a little bit of a, of a misnomer because so many important programs fall under this particular title, but this really shows you what those different policy and programmatic areas were. So for Subtitle A, you're covering livestock, for Subtitle B and so on and so forth, agricultural and food defense support uh, programs for historically underserved producers, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, the Department of Agriculture Re Reorganization Act of 1994, and so much more that goes into that. And so it's really well organized and definitely suitable for folks from the general public who are interested in this, but definitely also for the folks who are currently involved in the 2023 reauthorization process. Next slide. So this is a really interesting part to, to think about because our food and agriculture system in the United States and abroad is so broad and, and comprehensive. And there are a lot of corresponding issue areas that lawmakers care about, that um, advocate groups care about, that lobbyists care about, that are tangential to the Farm Bill, but not necessarily part of the reauthorization process. One of those issues being farmers and farm worker labor, which is so important and crucial to being able to have a healthy and flourishing food system, to have our food that's um, grown and provided, you know, maybe with different sustainable practices and things of that nature. But actual labor is covered by the Department of Labor. And so when we're going through the reauthorization process for this farm bill, different issues that are tangential to this might come up, but this is outside of the jurisdiction of the Farm Bill. Also for public land grazing, that falls under the Bureau of Land Management, specifically the, the Department of Interior. Also really important for farmers, especially those who are doing ranching and things of that nature, but the laws governing that fall under the Department of the Interior, not under the US Department of Agriculture. Water access and water rights, also under the Department of Interior. Food safety is primarily under the Food and Drug Administration, 
though within the Farm Bill, the research title does make some funds available to different institutions across the country to do research on invasive pests and species and things of that nature, but food safety as we know it primarily is under the jurisdiction of the Food and Drug Administration. Two really important nutrition programs, the school, school meal program, national school breakfast and school lunch program, after school meals or supper programs, and also the supplemental uh, nutrition program for women, infants and children, also known as WIC, are under the jurisdiction of the US Department of Agriculture, but the authorizing language for these two programs is under child nutrition reauthorization or what was passed in 2010, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010. That typically has also been under a five year reauthorization process, but it had that particular bill has not been reauthorized since 2010. And so the programmatic um, funding levels and authorization of, of those things are still in place, but it hasn't made any um, adjustments for expansion or innovation or a lot of innovation to those particular programs, at least not on a wide scale level that you would typically see with a full reauthorization process. And then air quality falls under the um, Environmental Protection Agency or the EPA. These are all really important issues, but fall outside of the jurisdiction of the Farm Bill and largely outside of the jurisdiction of the USDA, even though we know that these things are tangential and definitely of issue to people, um, of issue and importance to people who also care about the Farm Bill. Next slide. I think it's really important to also dig into who the key players are. We know that this is largely within the jurisdiction of Congress, especially the House Agriculture Committee, the Senate Agriculture Committee, but there are a lot of other actors at play here, primarily the U.S. Department of Agriculture, who is responsible or what is responsible for implementation of these programs, for evaluation of these programs, and actually reaching the farmers, the producers, and people on the ground who are implementing and receiving funding that has been authorized through the Farm Bill. As we saw earlier in two of the previous slides, in terms of actually getting the bill through Congress, it has to be signed by the White House. And as we've seen from the historical context that Jim provided, there's been some back and forth there in past farm bill years. There also are leads on key marker bills. Marker bills are smaller bills that are introduced into the House and Senate that are meant to garner interest amongst members of Congress, are meant to push particular issue areas, but are not introduced with the intention of making it through the full legislative cycle and being put into law. The goal is to have those smaller bills be part of the largest, be part of the larger legislative package that ultimately makes up the farm bill. And oftentimes when we see marker bills introduced, you'll have a particular member of Congress who cares about a specific issue area, who cares about um, that you know, particular thing related back to their region or to their particular district and are often looking for co-sponsors, um, hopefully in a bipartisan way, to get those uh, particular bills introduced and ultimately into the, 20, into the 2023 Farm Bill reauthorization process. We have your, your chairs and your ranking members. And right now in, in the House of Representatives, that is primarily um, our chairs of Republican and then within the Senate, that is a Democrat. And between those two, there's a lot of negotiation that is expected to happen. And one of the other areas that we're gonna talk a little bit more about different interest groups. And so I think it's a really interesting position to have when you can't necessarily lobby, but you're able to do education around certain areas that are related back to the Farm Bill. That is definitely the case for the, for the Berkeley Food Institute. And so in our capacity, we're often trying to be available in a very similar nature to EESI to provide education and insights into why the Farm Bill is important, how it ties back to particular issue areas that we care about, to the states that we're representing and things of that nature. Next slide. And so for the folks on the call who are maybe staffers or part of the committee, and um, maybe this is your first uh, farm bill reauthorization process, you know, there are a lot of different groups that are going to be reaching out to you and have a particular interest in elevating particular issue areas. And that is extremely broad. There's no one particular group that's going to come through the door um, talking to you about a particular issue. You have trade associations, anti-hunger and, and, and nutrition groups, which I feel pretty familiar with given my work um, when I used to be in D.C., public health groups, groups that care about conservation and environment, increasingly groups that are pounding the pavement around racial justice issues, especially as it relates back to issues of discrimination and righting those wrongs with this particular farm bill. Biofuels, as we've seen before, there is a robust infrastructure in place representing groups from native communities and that have tribal interests, um, especially coming out of the legacy of different class action lawsuits that have been faced by the USDA by these particular groups, but specific issues that tie back to Indian country and different issues that are specific to people living on tribal lands. We have rural and economic development groups, 
Increasingly, universities and land-grant institutions, I want to bring it back to the research title or Title VII, um, that is a broad swath of, of funds and supports that are made available to universities. And uh, one big issue area there too is research facilities where this really groundbreaking work takes place and making sure that those um, facilities are up to date and up to, up, to, up to code and standards so that the work that can be, um, that's funded to be done can actually take place. Also banks and insurance providers, pharma nonprofits, think tanks, supply trade interests, it really runs the gamut. As you could see with the 12 titles that make up the farm bill, there are probably several groups within there that have, that have interest in issues that they wanna to elevate to members of Congress and to the committee that they ultimately wanna see in the Farm Bill. Next slide. I wanted to highlight an example of a, of a marker bill that's coming through Congress right now that is, that is both uh, bipartisan in, in terms of both parties and also bicameral, meaning that it's been introduced in the House and also in the Senate. This pertains back to local processing for livestock and poultry and supply chain issues, the ability to, local, uh, to strengthen local food systems and to support small meat and poultry processors. And I think in the political climate that we're in right now that um, is going to require a lot of negoti negotiation for the 2023 Farm Bill reauthorization. It's really encouraging to see that there's bipartisan support for this particular bill from Senators John Thune, Sherrod Brown, and Representatives Shelley Pingree and Representative Jim Baird. And this is something that we're monitoring pretty closely, not officially endorsing it, but just wanted to model, show this to you all as a model of a bill that has both support from both parties and in both chambers and is something that will just be watched closely throughout this particular process. Next slide. I wanted to um, also share an opportunity to stay connected on this particular work. We are having a, a congressional briefing next Tuesday um, in the Russell Senate office building in room 385 with the Berkeley Food Institute where I work, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives and also American University. The representatives who will be on this particular panel are from the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, another group that's focusing on um, a policy research center for, for socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers another group representing the National Young Farmers Coalition with moderation from our executive director. This is a really rich time for gathering information, for staying connected on different issues that are both intersecting and warranting of their own, you know, sort of attention and investigation as we go through this particular farm bill reauthorization process. And my contact information is below and look forward to taking questions that you all have as we near the end. Thank you. Thank you. That was, oops, let me turn my video back on. I thought I did. Sorry. There we go. Thank you. That was great. Your um, issue group slide looks a lot like our RSVP list for today's briefing. So um, I think that's probably a good sign in terms of who's paying attention. Um, lots and lots of stuff covered, and we still haven't even gotten to BART yet. If you have questions for our panelists, send us an email, ask, that's ASK at ESI.org, or follow us on social media at EESI online. And that brings us to our fifth presenter today, Bart Fisher. Bart is a research assistant professor and co-director of the Agricultural and Food Policy Center in the Department of Agricultural Economics at Texas A&M University and serves as senior advisor for federal relations in the office of the vice chancellor for Texas A&M AgriLife. His applied research focuses on solving real world policy problems for agricultural producers and on anticipating potential policy changes for Congress to consider. Before joining Texas A&M, Bart served for more than eight years on the House Agriculture Committee, and most recently, he served as a Deputy Staff Director and Chief Economist under the leadership of Ranking Member Mike Conway of Texas. He's a fifth-generation uh, farmer who was raised on his family's wheat, cotton, and cattle operation in south, southwest Oklahoma, and there he continues to be actively involved. Bart, really looking forward to your presentation today. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks for joining us. All right, Dan, well, thank you very much. It's uh, great to be with you all today. Um, I am the, the fifth speaker here, so I will endeavor uh, to try to pull all of this to, together in a very quick, uh, succinct way. But I think if you've heard one theme uh, throughout the pr uh, presentations today from my colleagues, it's that context matters, right? And so I think one of the first places I'll, I will start uh, is with a little bit uh, of context uh, as well, and I'm going to zoom. You know, Jim did a great job at the at the outset of talking a little bit about the budget process. I'm going to zoom back out, and you may uh, look at this. And if you're uh, if you're not uh, a budget nerd, you may not enjoy this slide as much as I do. I definitely nerd out uh, on a good pie chart, uh, but mainly because I think it does a great job of capturing the entire federal government and and context or the place in which you know the farm bill finds itself. And so if you look at the top of that chart, it's really trying to capture uh, discretionary spending. Half of that is defense, 
Uh, the other half of that is things like salaries and expenses in the federal government and so on and so forth. Uh, and if you add net interest to that, that accounts for about a third of our, our federal budget. Uh, and for, for discretionary spending, those of you that work on the Hill know this well, uh, those priorities are debated every single year. They're debated annually. They're debated against a backdrop of caps that have been put in place primarily under BCA and other successive uh, budget deals, but those are negotiated annually. Uh, if you look at the other two thirds of that pie chart though, it's other mandatory spending. So these are things that the authorizing committees like the, the agriculture committees have passed in into law. The thing I wanted to highlight is that the vast majority of these and the three at the bottom account for really half of the entire federal budget, but the vast majority of them are on autopilot. Uh, seldom reconsidered, they're largely permanently authorized where they, uh, where there's a lot of interest and certainly political support, but they don't necessarily get revisited that often. Uh, and you contrast that then with a the farm bill, where as it's been mentioned a couple of times on this Zoom, the farm bill comes up every five years like clockwork. And why do I mention all of this? I think after, you know, after almost 10 years of working on Capitol Hill and trying to, you're trying to find a way to succinctly describe the process, I, I think this does it because you know, where so much of the federal government is on autopilot, uh, the farm bill is not. And that creates a very interesting dynamic. Uh, on the one hand, it can be a good thing, right? Every five years, you get another, another bite at the apple, an opportunity to make changes or improvements, or if your priority wasn't considered in a previous farm bill, it gives you a chance you know, you know, to live to fight another day, uh, you know, to potentially have your priority reflected in a future farm bill. Uh, the challenging side of it uh, is that it collects a whole lot of baggage that may have nothing to do with a farm bill. And so if you're a member who's you know, greatly concerned about the debt and don't have a lot of opportunity to vote on bills to constrain the debt, you know, here comes a farm bill. And so it's often when I, when I look back, you know, on the farm bills that I was a part of, and see some of the amendments that are offered, for example, uh, they're often head scratching to me because for the, the people who you know, work with those programs you know, where, that are incredibly, where these programs are incredibly important to these individuals, some of these amendments uh, are a bit of a head scratcher for those of us who work it, in this space. And I think part of it is just a reflection of the fact that so much of the federal government is on, is on autopilot. And I think for, for those of you who plan to engage in the Farm Bill who might be new to it, it's really important to, to understand that, right? Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's key to stay focused on the topic at hand because the Farm Bill does attract a lot of attention. And I think, um, you know, this is a, a big reason why, just by virtue of the fact that it comes up uh, uh, every five years, which nowadays is pretty unique. Uh, this particular Farm Bill too is also against the backdrop uh, you know, of, of, of debt. Uh, it's not lost on me that today, you know, Congress is having conversations about raising the debt ceiling and whether or not that will be paired uh, with spending cuts. Uh, it is somewhat ironic to me because when I joined the Hill now 12 years ago, back in 2011, debt was, was all uh, we were talking about at the time. And it was the primary reason why it took three, going on four years to get the 2014 Farm Bill passed because it was against a backdrop of concern about debt. The irony is that the debt has more than doubled since then. Uh, and so the, the big, one of the big question marks for me is what does you know, that pretend for a farm bill? How much is this going to factor into the farm bill? And I'm watching the debt debate right now you know, against the reauthorization of the debt ceiling very closely because I think it's gonna be pretty instructive for what uh, we may or may not have to deal with uh, in a farm bill if some of these debt conversations uh, were to, to spill over into a farm bill. Because while on the one hand, we have members uh, who are interested in cutting spending, and again, that's part of the debate being had today, uh, arguably, you know, in certain corners of the farm bill, there's a need for additional investment. And so how do those two things uh, come to a head? You know, I think we're all still waiting to see, but uh, particularly for those of you who are new to this process, you know, be on the lookout because I do think uh, this will factor pretty heavily into it. Uh, Jim mentioned at the outset and did a great job of setting the stage on, on budget. He mentioned that four titles, you know, primarily account for all the mandatory spending in the farm bill. And, and by all, account for most of it, it's about 99.8% of it is accounted for by those four titles. Title one, which I use here in this table, CCC price support as a proxy for, for title one spending. Conservation has been discussed, SNAP as well, and then crop insurance is in title 11. So those four account for the vast majority of the outlays. I think one of the, one of the dynamics we're watching now is that this farm bill is projected to cost considerably more than the last one. Uh, up significantly. The first one ever 
uh, to, to come out, you know, north of a trillion dollars. So again, with this debt conversation in the backdrop, you know, what does that portend for a bill? Uh, on the SNAP front, we know some of the fault lines of the last two bills, SNAP, you know, relative to 18 is up 82 uh, percent. Conservation on the conservation front, it's up, spending is up there. Uh, but what, you know, you've got to read the, the finer points to know that the vast majority of that is because of the infusion that came about in the IRA, right? And so that was a, an intentional infusion made in the last Congress. Uh, the last point I'll note here, you know, at the top of that chart for the, the CCC, you could think of this, uh, Jonathan mentioned, you know, going back to the early farm bills, 1933, you know, Title I of the farm bill is sort of your traditional reason for doing farm bills, income support for farmers and ranchers. Uh, you'll note that the baseline there is up a little bit. I think it's a bit misleading in part because about 10 billion of that uh, is what the, you know, the Congressional Budget Office sets aside as their expectation for what future secretaries down at USDA will spend in ad hoc spending. That's not something that has historically been reflected in the baseline, at least not to that magnitude. So I would argue about 10 billion of that is really phantom baseline. It doesn't really exist. And so what that means is for the traditional support to growers, it's largely has flatlined and even gone down effectively since the last back, the last uh, uh, farm bill. And that's against a backdrop of all the chaos we've seen coming out of out of COVID. And so where do we where do we go from here then, particularly on that first point? I'll start there with Title One. I think one of the biggest threshold questions right now uh, is where the conversation is going to go on traditional farm policy. House Ag, they're having a hearing today, two panels, 10, ten witnesses, you know, where they're exploring this very topic. But what we've seen over time is Title One, the traditional farm programs, income support, now accounts for about three, three to four percent of a farm bill. Uh, and it's extraordinarily targeted, which is why on this chart you see there in the middle, the 2018 farm bill was about $60 billion uh, over 10 years uh, in total for writing, 20, uh, writing Title One of the 2018 farm bills. So there are many who feel you know, that the pendulum has probably swung too far. Uh, and it's one reason why you see the red box there that in the last five to six years, we've spent north of $90 billion, the appropriators have in ad hoc unbudgeted assistance. And so it raises this question mark of will there be an additional infusion uh, into the farm bill? Uh, quite frankly, I think it's gonna be necessary. Our, our conversation here today is about path and process to get to a bipartisan farm bill. I think this question mark is one of the linchpins in whether, whether or not that can happen. Um, is is uh, is going to have a huge bearing uh, on the process. Another one that I'll mention, and I should give credit to Jim here as well, because Jim has historically been the authority over at CRS on tracking items that don't have baseline. And you think, well, why might these matter? So all of the spending we've talked about are for programs that have a, an ongoing budget where every farm bill, they don't have to come up with the funding to pay for it. But there's also a litany of programs in a farm bill they don't where it doesn't have baseline. Congress will just give it a one-time infusion. Uh, but typically there's an expectation that that's gonna happen in each, in each farm bill, in each successive farm, uh, farm bill. But absent new money to a farm bill, how do you pay for that? Generally by cutting somewhere else. And so this is one of the many things that the leaders of the ag committees have to weigh and that are they going to be able to trim elsewhere or secure additional funding to be able to help uh, cover some of these things. And they run the gamut, the top there in the miscellaneous title, you know, this emergency citrus trust fund, you see a few uh, organic provisions there, a couple of provisions on biofuel, uh, all the way down to things like feral swine control. All of those are programs that don't have baseline. Uh, I think the saving grace is that in 2018, we largely cut that list in half. So it's a much smaller list than it has historically been, but yet it's still something that the membership is gonna have to wade through, particularly the leadership of the ag committees in both the House and the Senate will have to, to wade through. Another one that's been mentioned here a lot is also the, in, the Inflation Reduction Act. There was a significant infusion, there were roughly 20 billion in budget authority. Now the estimate is that translates into about 15 billion in outlays or what you know, CBO expects USDA to cut a check for up to about 15 billion over the next 10 years. And so clearly there's a lot of political support for that, the infusion that was over and above the existing baseline for conservation. I think the question mark is, you know, what might happen in a, a farm bill conversation. So the, the blue on these charts was added in the IRA as part of budget reconciliation, which we don't have time to get into the nuts and bolts of today. But in the context of a farm bill, 
the leaders negotiating the bill certainly could revisit the blue. You know, they could reallocate it, they could use it elsewhere. And so that's another thing that we're watching closely is the direction they go there. Do they choose to revisit some of this? Uh, I don't necessarily think that all has to be bad either, or even viewed as a threat, because the challenge with the blue is that it does end. Uh, it has a finite shelf life in 2031. And so within the context of a farm bill, there are actually ways to reallocate where the blue could also stay in in perpetuity. And I can talk about that more in Q&A. Uh, if you like. I'm going to end here, uh, you know, by talking, you know, just using this slide as a point of discussion, and I'll wrap up here pretty quickly, because I do want to stress a little bit uh, this point of, you know, bipartisanship, and can we get a bipartisan farm bill? You know, when I joined the, the House, this number down here at the bottom was 242, 242 Republicans, and yet it was, it was very challenging to get farm bills done, both in 2014 and 2018. I do think the fact that you have both the House and the Senate so narrowly divided, uh, where the the, the membership is very balanced uh, in, in both chambers. I think it does lend itself uh, to a more bipartisan bill, even in the House of Representatives. So I'm encouraged by that. I think that's entirely possible to do. I will also, it's somewhat, uh, it, it's hard for me not to chuckle, you know, sitting now on the outside looking in and hearing all of the chatter about this bill and the talk about bipartisanship, because I think virtually every farm bill has started as a bipartisan farm bill. But you have where I started, you know, the pie chart where all sorts of interesting things happen in a farm bill. It's a very interesting political animal. And so we just don't know the path uh, that it's going to take going forward. But I do think it is entirely possible uh, to get to a bipartisan farm bill, uh, even in the House. But if it doesn't, uh, the last two farm bills that ended up partisan in one chamber still ended up bipartisan in the final product that went to the president, both President Obama and President Trump. And so I would uh, encourage folks, again, particularly those who are new to this pro pro uh, process, not to worry about the process, to focus on the substance, to engage, uh, and not so worry about the day-to-day -day minutia, because the Ag Committee leadership, you know, they're trying to, you know, I think they all endeavor to be bipartisan, but ultimately they want to get a good, uh, a bill done and a bill that's really good. Uh, done as well. One last point I'll highlight is that uh, for those of you who are engaging, whether you're off the hill or you're on the hill, just to give you a little snapshot of what's going on, you know, particularly at, at, at the committees. You know, of the 435 members in the House, I think it's something like 215 that have never voted on a farm bill. So almost half of the membership in the House have never voted for a farm bill. And of that, you've got 74 who were brand new in this Congress who may, prior to being elected, have never voted on anything, uh, certainly in the context of a legislative process. And so there's a whole lot of education going on behind the scenes right now. Um, there's also a lot of groundwork being laid. So field hearings are, are underway, and you have hearings, as I mentioned, happening right now in the committee. And so uh, the committee's trying to lay the groundwork. My encouragement to you uh, would be to work collaboratively with them uh, for those of you that are staff on the Hill, if you're interested in putting down marker bills like Sakina mentioned, reach out to your counterparts uh, over on the Agriculture Committee, Democrat or Republican, because I can guarantee you uh, they would like to work with you. And quite frankly, they would much rather work with you than find out about it in a press release and then have to try to figure out uh, how to navigate going forward. So with that, I'll stop there. Uh, look forward to your questions and really appreciate the opportunity to join you today. That was great, Bart, and a great place to end. I feel like this is a good situation where a teaspoon of honey is well worth, you know, well, well more valuable than a, a, a gallon of gall when it comes to working with committee. They they can be your friend or not. It's largely up to you, right? <laughs> um, and you know, your point about the half half of the house being new to the farm bill, and that's exactly you know what today's session is all about: um, getting people up to speed as quickly as possible. And um, I'll include Jonathan in the statement too, even though he's not with us in our Q and A. But I mean. Who could pick five better uh, panelists to help those staff people get up to speed? Tremendous panel and amazing chemistry uh, and uh, interaction between the panel. So let me invite everyone to turn your cameras back on uh, and uh, we will go ahead and kick off uh, our Q&A session. I'm really looking forward to getting into this. And um, I now that everyone's heard each other's presentations, um, I have a couple questions I'd like to start with. Um, and the first is, Jim, I think maybe we'll go back to you. And then since we it's been a while since we've heard from you, and then we can hear from Nadine and Sakina and Bart. But going back to the idea about sort of the history and the process and sort of the various political and policy drivers that are going to come to bear in the next 12 months to 
basically force Congress to work together in a way that the president can can go along with and get a farm bill signed. What are what what is what are some things about the farm bill um, from either political policy or stakeholder perspectives that that you anticipate coming to coming together um, to to make this thing happen sometime in the next year or so? I think we're seeing a lot in the press presently. If if Congress can figure out how far it wants to go with SNAP reforms, um, as Bart mentioned, figuring out what's going to happen with the negotiations over the debt ceiling, as much from the perspective of will it, how much will it derail the floor this summer in order to get to the farm bill. Bart laid out a lot of good suggestions, I think, about those dynamics too. Nadine, I'd like to hear from you about some of the different perspectives and why this is so important for you know, different farm bill constituencies, whether it's farmers, ranchers, conservationists, anyone. Yeah, um, well, I think all of those panelists really spoke to this in some regard that um, the farm bill ends up being important because it's so big and it covers so many areas and it covers so many stakeholders, right? And so it's crucial to farmers and ranchers. It's crucial to conservation. It's crucial to energy. It's crucial to, um, to beginning farmers, socially disadvantaged farmer groups. Like there's there's so much in there, nutrition and SNAP and kind of basic poverty alleviation, right? Like it's it's crucial in so many areas that what ends up being interesting and important is that this then lives, um, as Bart suggested, in a in a mechanism that has to be reauthorized and that has to get passed through sort of the gauntlet of current politics, right? And that has a strong bipartisan history, but also goes right through the middle of all the debates and all the disagreements and all the rancor and all the cooperation that happens in the country. And so I think it's, um, I think it depends on a lot. Um, one thing that I have learned over the years is it's, I think it's very hard to predict, um, but it's important to watch and see how it um, evolves. And I'd agree with Bart not to pay too much attention to all the minutia up and down, but, but give it a long, you know, a long view. Sakina, please feel free to jump in. Um, I think it's really important to pay attention to the farm bill. I mean, it touches every corner of food and agriculture policy, as you know, as has been reiterated during our time together already. I think one of the analogies that has felt most appropriate, especially working with students at UC Berkeley this semester, is just sort of thinking about the farm bill as a sort of like Super Bowl of like food and ag policy. It's really hard not to pay attention to it when it's in the news cycle, when it's under reauthorization and Coming from a state like California, where you know we're like a major producer for specialty crops, and just in terms of land mass, it's really huge. And thinking about our, our agriculture and extension network across the state, there are so many different interest points and different points of um, engagement. Considering that we also have members on the House Agriculture Committee and well, the House Agriculture Committee from both Democrats and Republicans, not on the Senate Agriculture Committee, but th those being really interesting points of. Um, leverage and connection as well and making sure that we're making space through the different educational and advocacy groups that we're a part of to engage with those members and I really want to go back to the point that Bart made is that there are so many members in the house who have who are voting for the first time and not been in congress before but have never you know sort of um been part of a farm bill reauthorization process and when we think about some of our strategy for engaging um, members of the House Ag Committee from California, it's not like our work just doesn't stop there. All the members of, of, of the House are going to have to vote on the bill that ultimately comes out of conference and makes it to the chamber floor. So how can we really bolster our education and make our interests and concerns known to those members and think broadly about the different points that touch on, you know, California's agricultural economy, but also thinking broadly on a on a national scale about what it looks like to make a healthier food system. Those are some of the things that cross my mind when I think about why it's important to engage in the farm bill and how we can really push that from an educational front when you have constraints around lobbying and your ability to make certain asks. And Bart, happy to give you the last word on this point. Um, if you have any thoughts about some of the um, some of the key drivers that you see coming together in the next year. Sure. You know, I think for me, and I, admittedly, mine comes partly from my perspective, you know, the center we run, we work for Congress, primarily looking at farm level impacts. And I, 
you know, on one hand, I, I love that we have a big omnibus farm bill, right? That we have this broad coalition, right? That there's a lot that goes in to support agriculture and food very broadly in this country. I think you know, part of my concern too, though, is that we've, we've lost sight over time a little bit, you know, on the farmers and ranchers who actually do, do feed us and the unique challenges that they face. And so I go back to a point that Secretary Vilsack has made a couple of times is that, you know, I, he gets to be a secretary, I get to be a professor, you know, we all get to have these jobs in part because we have people out there doing the hard work to feed us. And so part of it is, like we really squeezed over time the risk management tools available to those growers. And we've got to find that that right balance. And I don't think we're there right now. So I think that's something that the, the committees are gonna to have to struggle, to struggle through. One other one that you know I encourage everyone I talk to, and I know this applies to to our entire country and, and the government as a whole, but particularly in a farm bill, there is so much that is said. And yes, part of this is from having been on the inside for years, but facts really matter, right? And there's so much misinformation out there about what is and isn't in a farm bill. And you know, an example I always go to, you'll, you'll hear a lot about small and beginning farmers, and that's extraordinarily important. And I, but I've told, I've been told dozens of times, there's nothing in the bill for you know, small and beginning producers. To the point in 18, I asked our lawyers to craft a, a, a small and beginning farmer title so that we could highlight all of them. And it was so intertwined with the rest of the bill, they threatened to quit if I forced them to have a small and beginning farmer title. So part of this is, and I, I love having other, but particularly you know, from Jim at CRS, others in academia who, it's what we do, right? We educate and we speak the facts. And so I think that's extra, that is a big challenge just because, and I think it's great, we're having this conversation today too, right? Because it's a huge bill and there's not a lot known about it, right? And there's a lot of moving parts. So uh, I commend you guys for having this today. Well, that brings up a question that came in from our audience and I'm gonna tweak it a little bit because I think uh, it's kind of an interesting point and it's like works um, sort of flows from what you're saying, which is that the agricultural sector is incredibly diverse. Um, also, whether you know size uh, of, the, of the operation itself, what they're, what they're growing, what they're producing, how they engage with conservation programs, what part of the country they're in, what are their water needs, all of the all of the ways that what's not in the farm bill from Sakina slide affects the farm bill. But um, Bart, happy to start with you. And since this is an audience question, we can open it up to anyone who would like to, to, to share a comment. But what are some of the key challenges for some of these programs dealing with such a diverse agriculture, you know, agriculture sector? Is the answer just more programs and each one tailored fit? Or is it trying to make you know, sort of larger umbrella programs work for multiple different parts um, of the sector. Sure. Well, I, I'm not going to pretend that I have the silver bullet. <laughs> That's part of the legislative process, right? Members of Congress, you'll get to decide how to, you know to weigh all of these things. I think a couple. So maybe I'll just offer a couple of observations. I think you know, since, particularly since the 1996 Farm Bill, we particularly on the production agriculture side, we really struggle with that question because the hallmark there was you know. Let's let the market drive the discussion. Let farmers plant for the market, not for the federal government. And I would, to some degree, argue uh, that that uh, you know that that has been successful. But it also means where we do choose to engage, it's going to be more targeted. But how are we going to do that to make sure uh, that there's kind of equity, you know, in in the safety net? Um, I think one other observation I would piggyback off of that then is that probably one of the biggest success stories, again, on the kind of on the on the production side of the ledger would be insurance, right? We now insure over a hundred crops. We now have new policies that are targeted. We're we're in Title I, you don't really have you have a small presence on specialty crops in crop insurance. You have again, products available on over 100, uh, 100 products, and we're developing new policies targeted to those. And so I feel like we have a framework in place now with which to work, but it's always just about finding, kind of finding that right balance, which is, you know, it's subject to negotiation and opinions and education and all, and all of that. Right up to the line where the lawyers quit, right? That's where you, that's the line you can't cross. Right up to that one. Um, yeah, uh, Sakina, Nadine, and Jim, curious if you have any thoughts that you'd like to share with uh, about sort of how we, you know, how we manage the diversity of the agriculture sector in the U.S. Yeah, I'll just chime in very quickly, and I, I, I think I'll speak to this for the federally funded programs coming out of the Farm Bill and USDA, but also from the state perspective, too, with the California Department of Food and Agriculture. One of the things that advocates and, you know, the folks who are responsible for implementing programs always have their pulse on is technical assistance and making sure that farmers 
who are eligible for programs have the support that they need to be able to apply for them to get their you know appropriate financial documents and, and such in place that is a really um, challenging thing to do especially if you have like smaller regional offices that aren't as always accessible accessible um, or even like with the um, with the supplemental IRA funds that came out for the conservation programs it was such a rush just getting getting the knowledge out to people who are eligible for those programs by particular deadlines. And so I think across many programs that are authorized and funded by the Farm Bill, ensuring that there's appropriate funding and support for technical assistance is always a, an important thing to keep pulse on and is one of those things that is really important outside of Farm Bill years too and ensuring that people who are you know, eligible can access those programs, have appropriate language assistance and things of that nature. And so that's a challenge, but I think it's something that's always um, sort of on the forefront of, of being solution oriented as well. I might add just that in terms of, it's one of the things that I think makes Farm Bill interesting. So for those of you who are um, working on the Hill and maybe working on this for the first time, the fact that there's such a breadth and diversity of constituents um, gives strength to the bill, right, in the way that Jonathan highlighted, and also makes it really complicated and really difficult, right, and much messier in certain ways than it probably was in the 30s and the 40s when you could get everybody together in one room and figure it out. And so it both makes the process more difficult and also easier, right? There's questions of how to allocate money and there's these larger questions that I think come up. You know, I can say this um, coming from sort of an academic setting, it, it brings up questions about like, what's the role of government? What should government do? What kinds of services should be provided? You know, these basic questions of constitutional democracy come through the farm bill. And so it doesn't give you an easy answer, but it, it, it means that even if you don't know a lot or don't have a ton of interest a priori about agriculture, um, there's a lot to learn and there's a lot that really speaks to these larger issues of democracy and government that, that can be pretty fascinating and important. Nadine's answer was fine. I don't need to edit anymore. All right. Well, in that case, Jim, we will let you go first in our lightning round because we're just about out of time. And so the question I would like to pose to everyone as we wrap up today is, uh, if everyone could offer one, maybe two examples of what you know now that you wish you knew then uh, when you first started working on the Farm Bill or agriculture policy. Jim, what would you, what do you know now that you wish you could tell your, your previous self, your, your past self before you got started on this work? So I think when a lot of, when we come into the Farm Bill as individuals years ago, you come in with one particular topic, whether it's conservation or nutrition, or in my case, you know, the farm supports or commodity supports. And when you do that, you're very narrowly focused. And so I think what I wished I felt better was the breadth in the process, um, what we've done today, um, how it all fits together, I think is really my answer. Uh, and I've learned a lot of that just by watching over a few farm bills, um, but process, you know, settings like today can, can really help speed, speed that up. Nadine, we could go to you next and then Sakina and then we'll and then we'll hear. Yeah, um, I think there are a number of things that I learned over the years that I might have liked to to realize early on. Um, one is that this is a long game. There's a lot of fireworks and there's a lot of drama that comes out of DC or that seems to come out of DC. And it's all important, but but policy changes slowly, it changes incrementally. It builds historically on what came before, and it's it's a long game. So there's a there's an issue of patience in there that I think is important to keep in mind, in particular when you're outside the Beltway and working through a news cycle that really likes all the all the fireworks, right? Um, I think the one other thing that I would say is that you know these kinds of bills historically they're not necessarily built rationally, right? Like nobody sits up on a hill and says, this is exactly what we need in our food and farm policy. They're built historically over time and added to and changed, right? And so that means that from the outside, a lot of this can seem irrational, right? Or, or and, and so it's important to keep in mind the historical context, how it's built and how that affects how things change. And the fact that a lot of the times the fireworks you hear in the news cycle outside of the Beltway 
don't always reflect the way things work on the Hill, right? That I, I remember experiences of talking to people who are working on the Hill and talking a lot about how bipartisan their work is, even though that's not necessarily what you hear in the news cycle. And so that I think has always been a really key takeaway for me. That's such a good question. And I think there are two points that that come to mind. When I you know, first started working in this space, I was almost exclusively focusing on food and nutrition programs, considering that SNAP takes up you know, anywhere from 75% to 80% of, of expenditures for, for the farm bill. But it was really enlightening to learn about the different titles and to learn about the different broader farming and food issues and food systems issues that the entire farm bill make up. And so if you find that you, know, you have one particular area of concentration or expertise, like explore, read the bill, all 538 pages of it, or you know, look at different sources like, like what's available on EESI and, and other groups too that focus on the different issue areas. A few that come to mind are definitely like FRAC, the Food Research and Action Center, National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition, especially if you're coming from a more advocacy background. They produce really wonderful research and work in great bipartisan ways across those different issue areas. And the other part I'll say too is that if you are, you know, coming into this from a more um, advocacy background or coalition building background, diversity of coalition matters. Working with groups that are in urban areas and rural areas is really important. Older farmers and younger farmers, different cross-racial organizing groups and things like that are super important and only make for stronger work in the end and a stronger sort of organizing body if there's like one particular issue that you want to elevate to Congress, but also on the other end for, for folks who are staffers or, or working on the Hill, um, that, that's a really robust learning opportunity and to see different groups coming together that might not always have similar interests but are coming together for that particular issue, I think is really powerful and really gives you an appropriate lane to sort of like use your policy skills, your education skills, and just building up morale and support around for different issues that maybe wouldn't get as much attention if, if it was just one particular group driving that issue. So cross uh, cross group coalition building and you know keep exploring all the farm bill just just read all of it if you can if you have time it's it's a lot but it's worth it and i think dan i'm i may uh, i think i'm i'm up last um i may wrap up a little bit more philosophical kind of looking back on my time on the hill in, in two parts one of them actually piggybacks off nadine and so this is kind of focused more on folks who are watching this who are coming from outside the process who aren't on capitol hill and that is if if you are watching cap cable news uh you know which makes money off of reporting every little thing that happens and magnifying it uh you may look with a lot of skepticism on washington dc but i left after almost 10 years of working there i left with more respect for the process and not less and so the reality is from from having worked alongside a lot of, of folks there are really good people working on capitol hill uh, who are well-intentioned, who don't know everything, but who want to learn about your issues. And so engage uh, engage with them. You know, our process, as was noted, may, may have been to Dean in her, her comments, our process is designed to be slow and painful. The founding fathers intended it, right? Uh, and so it's done by design, but it's also magnified by a lot of other outlets who profit off, off of that. And so my, uh, my encouragement to you is to not be cynical about the process. Don't give up hope, engage in the process because there are really good people working on this. The second part is for those who are watching, who are working uh, on Capitol Hill, I think there's often this, I mean, this is human nature, right? That I'm in this new role, I'm supposed to know what I'm doing. You can't know everything, you're not going to. And my encouragement to you is don't be afraid to ask questions. You got a huge uh, resource in Jim sitting uh, over there, but frankly, uh, all of us. So don't be afraid uh, to ask questions. If you call someone and ask a question and they make you feel stupid, then call one of us because we're not going to make you feel that way. We want you to be successful. I get calls almost every single day from Capitol Hill answering questions. And so don't be afraid to ask your question. It's, it is okay, uh, much better you know, to get the information you need than to sit there trying to make these decisions and advise your, your boss uh, through intuition, right? Use those resources at your disposal. So um, I, will, I, will, I have lots of them, but I'll stop there, Dan. Well, I think that is a great place to uh, to leave it. And Jim, I look forward to maybe finding out how many voicemails you get this afternoon uh, for people who want uh, all of your great resources. And Bart, I was actually thinking that you might say to your 2011 self, if you think the debt is something now, just wait until the 2023 Farm Bill debate. 
Um, this is great. This was such a great panel. And I know Jonathan had to leave us for his class, but um, tremendous panel. Jim, Nadine, Sakina, Bart, and Jonathan, wherever you are in class, thank you for being with us today and sharing your tremendous uh, expertise uh, and perspectives. This was a, a really great panel and perfect way to kick off um, our Farm Bill series. Sakina, you mentioned this is like the Super Bowl. I was thinking it was like the FIFA World Cup. Like every five years, everybody's a soccer fan or every four years, everybody's a soccer fan. And I think that's more appropriate miss. with the timing. True. Right. People are like, you know, Chris, you know, everyone's, you know, commenting on Messi's skills. I didn't know who Lionel Messi was until a couple months ago. Um, but that's exactly what this is all about and providing resources to help everybody get up to speed very quickly. So thank you so much for an excellent panel. I'd also like to take a moment and thank my ESI colleagues for doing all the hard work to put it together. Uh, that starts with Dan O'Brien, Omri, Allison, Anna, Molly, and we have three great summer and in spring interns with us right now, Lindley, Isabella, and Madeline. So thank you for all of the work that they put in. Um, we have a bunch more briefings coming up. Uh, we will be back two weeks from today with uh, climate, energy, and economic win-wins. Then on May 24th, we'll be back for rural development. Uh, June 7th will be all about the future of forestry. And then June 21st, which is the fifth in our five-part series, is conservation practices. In addition to these briefings, uh, we also, uh, or RSVP for the briefings, right there. Just everyone should do that if you haven't yet, because even if you can't attend, you get the archived webcast, you get the presentation materials, you get the summary notes. All of those resources will be extremely helpful going forward, I promise. Um, we also have some really additional or some additional other farm bill resources. This is one of our side by side by sides. Uh, it, this is the rural energy savings program, which is our favorite uh, part of the farm bill. Um, but you open it up and it has a place for the existing law. And then eventually when we get House text and Senate text, we'll be filling that in. Um, designed to make the life of a congressional staff person easier. Same thing with our uh, article series that we're putting out. Same thing with our hearing tracker. Uh, same things with our, other, our regular articles and podcasts. Uh, and the best way to keep up with everything is to subscribe to our biweekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. And you can do all of that uh, by visiting us online at www.esi.org. Sorry for going a few minutes late. I always say that because we always go a few minutes late. But if anyone in our online audience today uh, would like to uh, tell us how we did, share your feedback. This is a link to a survey. Uh, we had a robust audience today, and I really appreciate that. And we take all of your feedback very seriously. We read every response, and we always do our best to improve. So if you have a few moments and you'd like to share your thoughts, if you had a problem with the live cast, if you have ideas, uh, anything like that, we'd be really happy to hear that feedback. It really does help a lot. We will go ahead and wrap up. Uh, thanks again to our great panelists. Thanks to my colleagues. Uh, thanks to everyone in our online audience. And we'll be back here uh, in two weeks for uh, economic, wait, energy, wait, what is it? Dan, I'll go back two slides. I get the, the order of the words mixed up. There it is. Climate, energy, and economic win-wins in the Farm Bill. That's May 10th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. And until then, thanks so much and hope everyone has a great Wednesday afternoon.